Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is Episode 9, The Walls of Constantinople. History lovers, especially Roman and Byzantine history lovers, are aware that the walls of Constantinople, the Theodosian Walls, helped keep Constantinople intact for nearly a millennium. While various groups targeted the empire and took different territories away from Byzantium's control, the walls held the capital. How were they created? What was life like inside them? What changed that allowed the Ottomans to come barreling through them in 1453? And what is left of them today? My guest is Patrick Wyman, the author and voice behind the late Fall of Rome podcast and the New Tides of History podcast, which examines the large movements that have changed the world. We discuss how he became interested in the fall of the Roman Empire, what forces led the Eastern Empire to create the Theodosian Walls, and why he believes they're one of the most important feats of military engineering in history. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. So my guest today is Patrick Wyman. He is the host of the New Tides of History podcast, which if you haven't checked out yet, is fantastic. And formerly of the Fall of Rome? Yeah, formerly of the Fall of Rome. Yeah, show's all done now. Okay. So how does it feel to be on this new adventure? Feels pretty dang good. Um, This is kind of my attempt to go pro as a history podcaster, I think. Like, I I pretty much started the fall of Rome from my living room with with a microphone and no idea of how to edit audio. And I was really surprised at how many people seemed to like it. And it allowed me to continue doing history after finishing my PhD, which was which was really nice. Like, you know, I didn't like I finished up and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I thought I didn't want to give up history entirely. So I'll give a podcast cast to try. And now it's pretty cool. I get to do this as pretty much my full-time job. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So for listeners who aren't familiar with your work, although I imagine that many, many of them are, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got interested in, well, I guess the fall of Rome is ancient history, but then you're also, your new podcast is covering the rise of modern history. So how did you become interested in these two major strains of world events? Uh, Kind of by accident, actually. So I was, uh, when I was an undergraduate, the thing that I first wanted to work on was the fall of the Roman Empire. I don't know why, but it it, it had always interested me. I think I was just into barbarians at that point. I thought barbarians were pretty cool. (laughs) So I wanted to learn more about that. But as luck would have it, the semester that I was writing my undergraduate thesis, the person that I would have worked with to do something on the fall of the Roman Empire was uh, on leave. So I ended up doing a thing on kind of late, uh, on late medieval, early modern warfare. And I always kind of had that in the back of my head. When I went to, when I went to graduate school, when I did my master's, I went back to working on what I thought I was going to work on originally, which was the fall of the Roman empire. And that's what I worked on for my PhD as well. Uh, that's what I wrote my dissertation on. It's what I've spent the better part of the last decade working on, but I kind of always had in the back of my head an interest in the late medieval and early modern periods. So basically 1350 to 1650 or so I always thought was just the coolest, most interesting period of time. And I kind of forgot about it while I was working on other things professionally. But now that I've got this show and I've got the opportunity to kind of step outside my academic specialties, it's really cool to come back to stuff that I had always been interested in. That's fantastic. So before we get into um, our topic for today, I personally have a theory that no matter what you're doing right now, if you're putting out content on the internet, whether it's a podcast or a blog, you're going to get people who are interested if you're doing good work. I've met many history professors who do amazing work, but they don't have a mass audience and you really care about getting it to people. It's really important to me that academic historians find ways to reach mass audiences because otherwise, really, I mean, what are you you doing it for? I think history is unlike a lot of disciplines in that the broader public is absolutely interested in it. But at the same time, the people who are actually talking to the public about history are generally not academic experts. There's not a ton of crossover, except in very specific disciplines. I think African-American history is one where there is actually a lot of crossover between academic understandings and popular understandings. But for the most part, the way that history is practiced in universities is really disconnected from people's actual popular understandings of those periods. Like historians just aren't the ones doing that. And to be able to reach those people, you have to have some understanding of mass media. And that's just not a thing that you're ever going to take a class on in graduate school. Like we were actively discouraged from 
learning ways to write and and reach like mass audiences. It was not thought to be what we were there for. So now having the opportunity to do this, it's nice to be able to take concepts that are are actually like common and kind of consensus in the academy and, and expose them to a new audience of people. Well, that's awesome. And thank you for doing all of that great work. Whenever you find a really good new podcast, it's so exciting. So it's much more fun than if you had a really fantastic book in the back of a library that I never came across. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, there, like my trust me, my dissertation, there is not a single person in the world who would be like interested in reading that. That is, <laughs> oh, oh my God, is just the, the most incredibly boring thing you've ever looked at in your life. Like I remember it, as I was sitting in my dissertation defense, I was like, yeah, no, I intentionally tried to like kind of bury the method because it's deeply boring. Like I just, I looked at like 3000 letters that had been written and had, and had a whole thing on that. And I was trying to focus on the implications. And one of the professors in there was like, oh no, we'd like to hear more about that. Please tell us more about this, like deeply boring process of putting all these into a database. And I thought, <laughs> okay, I, I guess, like, I guess if you want to know more about that. <laughs> Okay, so I contacted you and thank you for getting back to me because you did not know who I was. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I said, I'd, you know, I'm going to talk about a place that you're interested in that I have also been. So sometimes I'll email people and I'll be like, you're an expert on this place that I've been and I want to talk about. But with you, your expertise is so broad. I was basically like, let's pick a place that, that you care about that I care about you. And so you picked the walls of Constantinople the Theodosian walls. And it happened to be one of the most transformative travel experiences I've personally had was standing on top of those walls. So I'm really excited to know more about them. Because I think people understand the walls of Constantinople are incredibly important in the history of the Eastern Roman Empire. But I don't know if they know really anything about them other than maybe that Theodosius was a part of getting them constructed. So the walls of Constantinople are are incredible. I mean, they're they're one of the great engineering accomplishments, I would say, of the of the past couple of thousand years. And it's really hard to overstate their historical impact. Like, I think it's really hard to point to a structure that has had as much impact on the way that history unfolded as the walls of Constantinople. And, I, and if it sounds like I'm overselling them, like I understand why why you might think that. But really, bear with me. It's a, it's a real thing. So as far as the the walls themselves are concerned, th they're generally known in scholarship as the Theodosian walls. They were built not by the famous Theodosius, like the really great Theodosius who died in 395. He was the last emperor to rule both halves of the of the Roman Empire, but by his grandson, um, who was the sometimes feckless or often thought to be feckless Theodosius II. Theodosius II gets a lot of crap in um, kind of older historiography because he didn't really do a whole lot. Like he's known as kind of a weak figure. He spent his whole life in a kind of ensconced in the imperial palace. He never led his armies out there. But he ruled for a long time. He ruled for 42 years. He started to rule as an infant. And it was during his reign from 408 to, to 450 that a lot of what we associate with the Eastern Empire was really set down, like the kind of mixture of like Roman civil and almost theocratic principles that that would come to like underline Eastern Imperial or Byzantine ideology for centuries on. Um, that all kind of crystallized during his reign, like the civil bureaucracy that was really the, the kind of crystallization of the civil bureaucracy in the East that happened under his reign. The first codification of Roman law in almost a thousand years happened during Theodosius II's reign, oh, kind of overshadowed by what Justinian did with the Corpus Iuris Civilis a century later. But the Theodosian Code was incredibly important, formed the basis for a lot of uh, Roman law in the West. Uh, that would go on to, to be really important over the next thousand years or so. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about <laughs> the walls. Um, so, yeah, the, I th but Theodosius II, out of everything that happened during his reign, everything that he did, I think the walls are, are the most important. So let's take a step back because I have a feeling that most people who are listening to this show – have a pretty clear understanding of what happened in the Roman Empire that led to Constantinople becoming the capital. However, I could imagine that maybe somebody's interest was more modern European history and they really are not ensconced in this strange underworld of Roman history podcasts that um, some of the rest of us are. Because I think that I take for granted like how many of the people that I know have listened to all of the different ones. So let's let's back up and so. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. And how did it get to move to Constantinople where these walls would even play such a big deal? 
Okay, so one of the things that happens in the later Roman Empire when we get past the year 284, which is when Diocletian um, comes to power after the crisis of the third century, this like 50 year kind of period of, of up and down disasters that, in, that encompasses a whole bunch of different things. There's plague, there's barbarian invasions, there's political instability, the economy falls apart, the system of coinage falls apart. All of this bad stuff happens. The system that emerges from that, that a guy named Diocletian puts into place, is one that kind of in that impresses the the division of the empire. That you couldn't just have one emperor anymore; you needed to have multiple people to handle this enormous territory that stretches all the way from Britain to the Sahara and from the Atlantic to to modern day Iraq. Like this whole area that was too big for any one person to handle. So you end up with multiple emperors. Diocletian has a co-emperor and Diocletian sets up shop in the east and his co-emperor sets up shop in the west. And at that point, you need not one capital. And even even at this point, emperors hadn't been spending much time in Rome for most of the third century. Um, and even before that, like Rome was still technically the capital, but the emperors weren't spending a whole lot of time there. They were mostly itinerant. They were spending a lot of time on the frontiers. They were spending a lot of time making circuits of their territory. Rome itself was not the center of the, polit of the Roman political universe the way it had been. So – after Diocletian, you end up with multiple capitals. You end up with multiple seats of power in the various parts of the empire. When you get to Constantine the Great, who after a series of civil wars becomes the sole ruler of the empire, Constantine decides that he's going to build himself a new capital in the east. The east was wealthier. The east was more populous. The east was frankly easier to rule than the west. There were fewer barbarians. So Constantine decides he's going to build himself a whole new capital. And modestly enough, he's going to name it after himself. So he builds this on an incredibly strategic spot, the ancient Greek city of Byzantium, which is where the Black Sea meets the Aegean. It's the only point through which you can reach the Black Sea from the Aegean. So it's a protected harbor. It's a great harbor. Uh, it's a protected spot of land. It's a great strategic spot. It sits at the intersection of east and west of Europe and Asia. It's a crossroads. It's inherently a crossroads spot. Now, in the west, you still have other capitals. Ravenna becomes the capital at the end of the fourth century, into the fifth century. But Constantinople grows exponentially. It becomes the most important city in the entire Mediterranean world and will stay that way for another thousand years. Now that it's the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, and we're not going to get into today when it becomes the Byzantine Empire. We'll, we'll leave that for a different, a different debate. But we have modern Istanbul, Constantinople, serving as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. And we have a bureaucracy building up there. And why did they decide that they needed to build these walls? And were there fortifications in place beforehand? Yes. So one of the common things with cities in the later Roman Empire, this Roman Empire of Diocletian that I talked about, which was fundamentally different than the early empire in a whole lot of ways. It might as well have been a whole different state in terms of how it functioned. One of the things that you see all over the late empire are city walls. Cities had had some walls before, but they hadn't really been as necessary just because – Internal security wasn't as much of a problem earlier in the Roman Empire. You had some barbarian incursions, but it wasn't constant. In the late empire, barbarian incursions were absolutely constant. Every city needed walls. You see this all across the, the Roman Empire, from uh, all the way from Britain all the way to the Far East. You see Roman cities building walls. Constantinople, because it was built in this period, had walls pretty much from the very beginning. They were called the Walls of Constantine. But they weren't as high. They weren't as extensive. They were still effective, and they, and they helped to see off off a couple of uh, incursions at the beginning of the 5th century. But basically, why you see the Theodosian walls is because of the rise of the Huns and the rise of Attila the Hun specifically and the Hunnic Empire. So over the course of the 430s, the 440s, they absolutely ravaged the Eastern European provinces of the Roman Empire. So Thrace, the Balkans, areas like that. Attila and his Huns just kind of tore through them. And at various points, they tried to lay siege to Constantinople. They didn't succeed, but the city's vulnerability was pretty clear. So if this was going to be the imperial capital, if your emperor was going to be ensconced there rather than out leading his armies, the city itself – needed better protection. And so that's why you get the Theodosian walls, the, the, you get this incredible circuit that exemplifies all the best of Roman military engineering, of Roman civic engineering. It's one of the last gasps, I would say, of the Roman Empire as we understand it in terms of, in terms of architecture and function. So for anyone that's not familiar with the Huns, or maybe they've heard Attila the Hun, they've probably heard Attila the Hun, but they don't know a lot about the Huns. Um, this is basically like uh, a Game of Thrones episode. 
You have archers on horseback, and they are attacking the city. Did they attack Constantinople directly, or did they just realize that they were going to be vulnerable because they had attacked other cities? So both. Um, they the the Huns had the Huns had sacked and raised basically every major city along the the Roman frontier along the Danube River, which was which marked the the boundary between Roman territory and barbarian territory. The Huns had basically gone down all the way from what's now Serbia into what's now Bulgaria, pretty close to Constantinople, and had raised pretty much every city of any size, every military base of any size. There, they raided to the south of Constantinople. They attack at that one point. They did try brief to lay siege to Constantinople itself. So the Huns were themselves a nomadic horsemen from the from the great Eurasian steppe, and they fought on horseback. But what made the Huns geniuses and why they had an actual empire is because they were really good at organization and incorporating other peoples and including Roman deserters who knew how to use siege equipment into their armies. So the Huns over the course of the 440s, uh, 430s and 440s, basically managed to subjugate huge portions of the Roman Empire. If, their, if the Hunnic Empire had lasted a little longer, thing, we would think about things much differently. But because it ended so abruptly with the death of Attila and what happened afterwards, we don't think very much about that like two decade period where really the Eastern Roman Empire was was subjugated. Like it was it was not in charge. They were not the ones dictating terms to the Huns. It was vice versa. So in this context, in this time where is the Eastern Roman Empire going to survive at all? Kind of up in the air. That's the context in which we see them building this incredible set of defensive walls. So this might be a little off topic, but if the Huns were so powerful and they were very much a part of a tradition, there were many other tribes like them. Why did another tribe not come in afterwards and become the next Huns and figure it out? Why does with the death of Attila, does it end? So the short answer is that they did. You see a whole tradition of steppe empires growing up in the Pannonian Basin and in, in what's now in what's now Hungary. The next ones were the were the Avars, and they actually laid siege to Constantinople in six in six twenty six in conjunction with the Persians. Um, the Avars were were an incredibly powerful empire that lasted for a couple of centuries until Charlemagne sacked their capital in the Pannonian Basin in the in the late eighth century. That's the short answer: is that there were the the long answer is that steppe empires are by nature a little more unstable. And they're not based so much as a type, and, and I'm generalizing here. As a type, they're not based so much around territorial control as they are control of peoples. So when you have the death of a of an overwhelmingly powerful leader like Attila the Hun, you have a kind of a decentralized situation where there are a whole bunch of subject peoples who can all stake their claim to rulership over the whole empire. So it's actually kind of an overstatement when we when we say that like, well, the Hunnic Empire fell apart. Well, yeah, it did fall apart, but it wasn't like it disappeared overnight. It's just that its subject peoples were fighting each other to determine who was going to have ownership of that. And when you get into the 470s, the 480s, the 490s, into the, into the beginning of the 6th century, there are still powerful organized empires out on the steppe. It's just our sources are pretty bad for them. And they were mostly doing things other than fighting against the Roman Empire. Gotcha. So let's go back to Constantinople. They know that they're going to need something like these walls. Do we know anything about the politics behind them or the building process that went into them? You know, I'm not sure. I don't think that I don't think we have good sources for it. We know that they were built during the that they were at least begun during the reign of Theodosius. We know that they conform pretty closely to the best practices of Roman military architecture at the time. We can assume that they were an enormous investment in time and resources. We can assume that they took uh, that it took tremendous labor to build them and it took tremendous resources to do that. But the Eastern Roman Empire at this point even had the resources to do that. In the, the 5th century in the West was a time when the tax base was shrinking, when central control was shrinking, when the population was shrinking. There were just fewer – there were just plain fewer people around for a variety of reasons. The 5th century was actually one of kind of general prosperity in the East. Um, the population was increasing. Economic output was kind of – it was increasing as, as far as we can tell. The po the population was not, uh, was not shrinking the same way. Tax revenues were pretty high. The Eastern Roman Empire had the resources to engage in projects like this at a time when the West did not. So there were – there were plenty of surpluses available to be put to use for something like this. And one of the benefits of, of, of the system as it was, was that although Theodosius II himself 
himself was kind of feckless. He was surrounded by people who knew what they were doing, especially his sister. It was a formidable figure and actually the dominating figure for most of his reign. There were people there who could make those decisions and they had the resources to put them into effect. Once they are up, how do they shape the history of the city? Well, they made the city effectively impregnable. That is the key point. That while other cities were vulnerable to siege, while other cities were vul- were vulnerable to attack, Constantinople really was not. You could shut up the walls as long as you had a, a substantial number of troops to garrison them, and there pretty much always were in Constantinople. And as long as the city could be resupplied by sea, which for the most part it could be because the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire maintained a pretty good navy – then the city could not be starved into submission. The walls could not be breached by the siege equipment that existed for most of that period. There were two layers of walls. This is a really key thing. So you have an outer moat, an outer wall, then a space between that, and then a much higher inner wall. So even if you were to somehow knock down a portion of the outer wall and get through there, you're still confronted by a whole other set of walls that are even higher and harder to get up that are effectively sheer. And if you're trying to bombard the walls to create a breach, if you're trying to use stone throwing machines or, or, or something of that nature, or you're trying to mine the walls, you're trying to undermine them to get under and, uh, and create a breach, you still have a whole second set of walls that's not reachable after you get through the first one. So that's why, as a feat of military engineering, it doesn't get much better than this. There's a theory that, I'm not sure if this is still current or not, I heard this when I was doing archaeological, when I was taking archaeological classes on castles about a decade ago, that the great castles of of King Edward I in England, things like Carnarvon Castle, which are what we think of when we think of castles, that because he had seen the walls of Constantinople on crusade, that's what he emulated when – and that's what he wanted and that's what he told his engineers that he wanted when he was building this incredible string of castles all over England. So – as a feat of military engineering, it's not going to be surpassed for a thousand years. Like it's it's as good as it gets. It represents the literal best practices of fortification that would exist for or from the fifth century AD all the way up until pretty much the end of the 15th century when you start to see another uh, kind of salad days of military engineering. But so because of the structure that it takes, they're effectively impregnable. There are no siege techniques really that are available that are easily going to get you through there. And if you try to take walls like that, if they're stocked and well garrisoned and everybody inside has food, there's basically just no way through them. And we see this again and again and again. We see sieges in the 7th century by the Avars, the steppe people, in conjunction with the Persians. We see sieges in the uh, at the end of the 7th century by uh, um, surging Arab empires of the, of the Near East. We see it again in the 8th century. We see it in the 9th century with the Bulgars. <laughs> we see it throughout the, the, the end of the Middle Ages. It, t- it took the Ottoman Turks a couple of tries before they finally took it in 1453 to get there, even after they had cannon. Their first try at going at the walls with with like cutting edge state of the art cannon still didn't work. So, I mean, there are literally dozens of attempts to take Constantinople after the walls were built, and it takes a thousand years. The greatest siege train anybody had ever assembled up to that point and tens of thousands of troops to finally take Constantinople. So your podcast, you like to get into the experience like a regular person, uh, a common person that maybe is somebody that history we don't have a lot of firsthand accounts about, but we can piece together things through archaeology and linguistics and um, DNA research. What would it have been like for a regular person inside the walls during one of these sieges? It, it depends on the period, I think. So the society in Constantinople could be pretty fractious. It was not, it could be divided in on itself. It was an ancient city in a medieval world, I think, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, where divisions within the populace were strong, where people had strong opinions, where people felt connected to their government in ways that we're not used to thinking of for that period. There's a great book um, that came out last year, I think, called The Byzantine Republic, um, that basically makes the argument that the the populace of the Eastern Empire, especially Constantinople, did not think that they were living in like a, an absolute hereditary monarchy. They thought that they were living in a system of government where their consensus mattered. So that was always going to be a factor, even as the city was under siege, um, was, the, was the sense of how the people of Constantinople related to their city and the kind of sense of ownership that they took of it. I think that that stands out pretty much for all the sieges up until the 13th century when uh, when the Venetians and the Crusaders took Constantinople in 1204. And there were a lot of those internal divisions had kind of become too much. But for the most part, I think the city, as long as you had the sea lanes open, you were going to 
you were going to survive pretty well. Constantinople always depended on imports. Every big city in this period depended on Im imported food. Um, you could not grow enough in the hinterlands to be able to feed a city of this size. So grain was grain was generally subsidized or provided free, one of the two. But to but to be in a city like this, as it was under siege in the Middle Ages, to some extent, you might not have noticed unless there were unless there were real shortages unless it was impossible for for food and supplies to get in or in the case of the ottoman sieges in the later middle ages it would have been terrifying because you would have had the boom of cannon you would have had constant assaults on the walls it would have been pretty terrifying but for the most part i mean you're talking about a city of half a million people if you have a besieging army outside that numbers in the tens of thousands you might not even notice as long as the soldiers are doing their jobs or the popula the entire populace might be mobilized in order to meet the the threat. It could go either way. Some threats, uh, some sieges were not a big deal. Some were absolutely existential and almost uh, and very, very, very nearly succeeded in, in taking the city itself. I want to pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Audible. For you, the listener of the History Fangirl podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. For today's episode, I want to recommend Lars Bronworth's Lost to the West. If you love Patrick's The Fall of Rome podcast and enjoyed Bronworth's 12 Byzantine Rulers, then it's time to get deeper into Bronworth's work. He has several amazing volumes available on Audible, but this is the one that started it for many history podcast fans. If you've never checked it out, what are you waiting for? To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl for your free audiobook. So the city is standing for a thousand years behind these walls, but the empire is slowly eroding outside of the walls. Do you want to kind of discuss the slow erosion of the empire over a thousand years? Well, so I think there's an interplay between those two things, because most of what people know about the Eastern Roman Empire, if, if they're kind of aware of it at all, is that it slowly declined, that it was just a long, slow decline into a into its grave, like that it lasted, if anything, probably longer than it should have, that it was kind of a shambling corpse clinging to the past glory of Rome that by the end it didn't deserve. That's kind of the standard narrative of the Eastern Roman Empire that they were they were tricky, that they were uh, that they were theocratic, um, that they were not trustworthy. Uh, that's what I mean. The adjective Byzantine as a as a descriptor refers to something that's complex and secretive. Like our popular conception of the Eastern Empire is not a positive one. And in large part, I think that has to do with the fact that they are historical losers. That like we know how that whole story ends. It ends with the last piece of a once great empire getting rolled over by the the cutting edge Ottoman Turks in 1453. But so basically the Eastern Roman Empire throughout the sixth century was doing just fine. As we get into the seventh century, they had even reconquered some pieces of the Western Empire, including Italy, North Africa, the part of the coast of Spain. Like the Eastern Empire was a going concern throughout the sixth century. It was the most important state in the Mediterranean. As you get into the seventh century, that was it was kind of riven by internal divisions. The they fought a series of long, punishing, attritional wars with the Persian Empire in the east that wore out both of them. They lost the the breadbasket province of Egypt. They lost Palestine. They finally won those back. They beat back the Persians uh, just in time for the newly converted to Islam Arabs to roar out of the Arabian Peninsula and take back like what was really the heartland of the Byzantine Empire to take Egypt to take the Levant, to take huge chunks of Syria, uh, to take North Africa, uh, eventually to take Spain. Like at that point, the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire lost what were its most important, its richest territories. And after that, like if you want to present it as a long, slow decline, I think you probably could uh, <laughs> and, and not and not miss too much. But but like when we talk about a long, slow decline, it's still like 700 years after that. So that's the that's the kind of weird thing about this narrative of decline is like, if you have a slope that's graded out at just a minimum, it's like an aqueduct water rolling downhill. You know, if it loses an inch of vertical drop over the course of a mile, do you even really notice that it's going downhill? Or is it only because we know where the water ends up that we notice the uh, the, the drop in elevation, I guess? It's, it's kind of a weird paradox of trying to come to terms with the Eastern Empire, like on its own terms to treat it as a thing and not just like a story where we know exactly how it begins and how it ends and to and to not read everything in light of the ending. But yeah, it's like over the course of the over the course of the next few centuries, things did not improve. In the 11th century, you get the Seljuk Turks taking large parts of Anatolia. Um, the first crusade was actually called in order to help 
the Eastern Roman Empire. That was that was supposed to be what happened was to help them take back some lands they had lost to the Turks. Didn't exactly end up helping them out too much. The Fourth Crusade, which was again supposed to go to the near to the Near East, they got kind of sidetracked and detoured and ended up sacking and capturing Constantinople itself in 1204. It took them until 1261 to or the remnants of the Eastern Empire to get the city back. And after that, the next 200 years are pretty. If you wanted to view the last 200 years of the Eastern Empire as kind of a pathetic rump, I think you could get away with that. <laughs> well, I think part of the problem is that it's bookended by the map that everyone has seen in school of Trajan. It, this is the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. And so it's like, well, if you have that, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is the 15th century. I, and I think that it's just, it is, it's by comparison. And it's not really fair. It's competing in an entirely different world. I mean, what will America look like in a millennium? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's that it suffers by comparison and, and not just to the empire of, of uh, Trajan and Hadrian, the Roman empire to speak, but also by comparison to the Ottoman empire too. You know, like when the Ottomans capture Constantinople in 1453, the population is, could be as low as 50,000. Like from a down from a peak of half a million or three quarters of a million, like, you know, six or seven centuries earlier. So when they took Constantinople, it was kind of a, it was already kind of a shell of its former self. I mean, it was still an important city. It was still a meaningful city, but it was not what it had been. And so but like within 50 years, Constantinople is, again, a massive, thriving city. So like when you look at that last period, basically from when they got the city back in 1261 to the end in 1453, like, it's hard not to see that as like, oh, guys, come on, man, what happened? Like, that's not good. One of the things you've touched on here is that, in part, the Crusades were to take back the Holy Land because the Byzantine Empire was a Christian empire, and now they were not being controlled by Christians. But when they got there, it was really occasionally just a power grab. This is one of the things that makes the Crusades really confusing from our perspective is that we, if we want to look at them as religious wars, well, they were religious wars and we cannot overstate the importance of piety and belief in terms of why people decided to go on crusade in the first place. It's really hard for us to, to wrap our heads around mindsets that lead people to do things that's going to cost them a huge amount of money, potentially their lives in order to go someplace they've never seen to fight people they know they really know nothing about. Like, it's an incredible expression of piety and belief. But in terms of how the Crusades themselves actually played out, the politics get really confusing. At first, you know, the Byzantine emperor Alexius Komnenus, it, it, when, uh, when the First Crusade shows up, is like, oh, I wasn't asking for an enormous expression of popular piety and belief. I needed soldiers to fight the Turks. So like the, the Byzantines grasped pretty quickly, I think, exactly how dangerous – something as wild and uncontrolled as the Crusades could be. And we're constantly trying to figure out what this new volatile element in the not exactly stable, but at least known quantities of of uh, of Middle Eastern politics would be like before the Crusaders showed up, the, the Eastern Roman Empire was aware of who the players were and how they played out. They were aware of what their weaknesses were, which is why they felt that they needed troops. But they were not dealing with unknown quantities. And when the Crusaders were injected into this mixture, which was already pretty volatile, it, there were already a lot of different players at a at a regional and uh, and local level, it just complicated things immensely. And the Byzantines, who had centuries-long traditions of diplomacy and intelligence gathering and doing things that their more rustic Western cousins were not uh, were not really familiar with, like, they were aware of how to play po power politics and to do so in complex ways that the Crusaders were not especially comfortable with. So mm -hmm. that's part of where we get the stereotype of like the tricky Greek and the and the and the tricky Byzantine Empire is because they were playing games within games and trying to understand how to, how all these pieces fit together and what they thought was was their land. Like when the Crusaders retook Syria, they thought that they were supposed to get that back. The Byzantines did. They didn't think that that was going to become a Crusader state. They thought like, oh, this you are restoring this to the Byzantine Empire. That's not the way. That's not the way that it played out. And so you can see how 
in that scenario, when it becomes clear that the that the Crusaders are not just there to help them out, that they're doing things on their own, that you end up with a really complicated mixture in which different varieties of Christian belief meld with a kind of the the overall struggle against uh, against Muslim controlled states. The power politics and religious and religious aspects blend together, but at the same time they're separate and they're but they're hard to separate. It's a really really confusing mixture, and it's hard to figure out. To what do we attribute the actions of of people like Alexius Comnenus or the Crusader lords or uh, Muslim lords at the same time? Like they're all operating in an arena of power politics that's mixed with a really heady kind of religious belief and fervor. So were the Crusades over by the time Constantinople fell? That is a really complicated question. (laughs) So, so yes, yes. At that point, the last thing that we would consider a major crusade was over. Um, the, the last one was really in 1396. It ended in a battle at Nicopolis that ended with like thousands of crusaders being beheaded by the army of the Ottoman Sultan. Um, thousands of like these aristocratic knights being, uh, being captured, humiliated and beheaded. So that was really the last great crusade was the crusade of Nicopolis in 1396. Now the crusading ideal remains important up into the 16th century. That's it's what you get called. It's what gets called on to raise the great armies and fleets to fight the Ottomans, like with the with the siege of Malta in 1565, what leads to the Battle of Lepanto in 1571 is very much in line with crusading ideology. But as a formal matter, crusades were done by the time Constantinople fell. Yeah. So after the fall of Constantinople, what happened to the walls? Did the Ottomans choose to rebuild the, them from the damage that they'd done? Or were they not important anymore? Because technologically speaking, they'd figured them out. So they immediately rebuilt the walls, pretty pretty much immediately. Uh, the the Mehmet II, who who conquered Constantinople, um, poured a tremendous amount of resources into taking Constantinople and rebuilding Constantinople afterwards. And he provided tons of inducements to get people to move there, because as I mentioned earlier, like the population had dipped way, way, way down from from what Constantinople could hold. Like there were huge open spots on the walls, like there was agriculture being practiced within what had been the city of Constantinople. So uh, Mehmet poured an incredible amount of resources into repairing the city, beautifying the city, building new things, repairing old things, uh, making sure the civic infrastructure worked. And one of the most important things was rebuilding the walls of the city, because I think Mehmet was was nobody's fool. Um, and as the next 27 or so years of his rule would, would point to, he was very much a conqueror, but he, he was aware that there was, there could well be a backlash. He was aware of the fact that, um, the Byzantines had been talking to Western powers and trying to get reinforcements and get a crusade to try to stop the fall of Constantinople. Like the crusading ideal was not dead. That that was the distinction I was trying to draw earlier is like everybody was aware that a crusade was a thing that could happen even if another major one didn't. So uh, Mehmet was aware of this. If there was going to be another crusade, taking Constantinople would be retaking Constantinople would be its obvious goal. So Mehmed immediately rebuilt the walls. Yeah. So he was he was mostly afraid of crusaders, not any of the local powers. No, because the, at, at this point, Constantinople was the last was really like the last outpost left of the Byzantine Empire. The Ottomans already controlled large stretches of the Balkans. They already controlled what uh, what most of what's now Bulgaria. Um, they controlled most of Greece. They controlled pretty much everything on, on that side, uh, on the European side of the Dardanelles, of the of the strait that, that separates Europe from Asia. Like, they already held that territory. Like, Constantinople was a little island in the middle of what was already Ottoman territory. I mean, I, I guess I knew that from the maps, but I, I can never remember who all is what is out there at any particular moment in history. Yeah. So like when when they went to take Constantinople, Mehmet didn't bring an army over from Asia. His army marched south from his capital at at Adrianople, what's now Adirna in Turkey. Like his army, his army was already on the European side. Oh, OK. So at that point, then you've got Bulgar- a Bulgarian kingdom or are they already controlled by the Ottomans north of there? Nope, that was that was already controlled by the that was already controlled by the Ottomans. What's now Albania, Macedonia, practically all uh, most uh, Serbia also like basically all the Balkans, Bulgaria, most of northern Greece. Like there were there were Venetian outposts along the coast of Greece or uh, pieces of the Venetian coast were controlled by the Venetians. Uh, Crete was Venetian. Um, Rhodes was Rhodes was Venetian or no Rhodes belonged to the the Knights Hospitaller. Uh, Cyprus was Venetian. But for the most part, 
they already controlled practically all of the Balkans, most of Greece, pretty much everything on the European side there. Like Constantinople was literally, they had even built fortresses along the, along the straits that led to Constantinople from the Aegean. Um, like they controlled literally everything except the city itself. If you're just a regular person in Constantinople or maybe a, like a low level member of the aristocracy, how could you not think maybe it's time to get out? Or is that why it was so depopulated? <laughs> well, a lot of people already had, yeah. This was a period where there were lots of Greeks fleeing to the West, especially to Venice. Um, that's why the city of Venice has such a good, and the, it's, uh, uh, its great library, the Bibliotheca Marciana, has such a great collection of Greek manuscripts. That's why this is right at the point where Greek culture starts, where Greek language and Greek culture starts to spread really widely. Like this is, you get uh, like the lost books of Aristotle that people had forgotten about in the West start to circulate again. Lots of formerly lost classical texts. Uh, this is when biblical criticism becomes a becomes a thing again when people start to look at their Latin Bibles and and compare them with Greek versions because there are Greek Bibles coming in from the East, Greek language Bibles. There had already been an exodus of Greek speakers to the West. The last Byzantine Empire had spent a lot of time in the West trying to drum up support for their rump state um, to try to get some like to try to basically get a crusade. They had agreed to end the church schism and uh, had come to agreements with the pope about how they were going to uh, about how they were going to close the gap. There was basically a lot of interchange happening and a lot of people moving from the east to the west already before Constantinople even fell. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize that they had been were trying to get the two churches back together. I travel around the Balkans a lot, especially this summer. I was, I've been to every country in the Balkans and, and most of Eastern Europe. I've seen very, very many Orthodox churches and I can't imagine what that country would look like if they weren't there. Like, and if they were just, I mean, I love Catholic churches too. I love church architecture, but I love seeing the diversity across Europe. So selfishly, I'm glad they didn't get back together. Well, it's it's an interesting kind of thing. It's it's one of those forgotten things because it didn't end up happening because they lost Constantinople. We've kind of forgotten that they actually did hammer out an agreement to do this. Like it was it was a thing that was in the process of happening as Constantinople fell. And it's become a thing that people talk about in the aftermath that like one of the reasons the Greeks didn't put up much of much resistance after the city fell was because better the sultan of the of the turban than the pope's mitre. That they were that the Greeks were so unhappy about reconciliation, about having to maybe give up some of their cherished practices, that they were not all that mad at, that they didn't end up having to do that because the Ottomans had taken the city. It's like it's a weird little forgotten thing. That's super interesting. I I've, I mean I've you know I've listened to Lars Brownworth and I, and the Byzantine History podcast isn't up to this point yet, but I've listened to you know Lost to the West and um and uh, I, I didn't I either I knew that and forgot or I never learned that that was going to happen. That's so interesting. Let's talk real quick about what happened to the walls. How because today there's like just little chunks of them left. So how did they go from this thing that the that the Ottomans worked very very hard and quickly to repair to 500 years later? They're so cool and you should definitely go visit them, but they're not what they were. Uh, just for example, like in Cyprus, the capital of Cyprus still has its Phoenician walls and like Jerusalem still has its walls. Like how did, how did Constantinople lose its walls? I think it's mostly due to the development of the city. Like I, I don't actually, I, I don't actually know the specifics on that, but I think it's just because the city kept expanding and expanding and expanding. And over the course of the the 19th century, I would say especially, they're like they just had to get rid of the walls in order to in order to allow more traffic to to move between the center of the city and its suburbs. Um, cons the, I mean, Istanbul now is so 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 enormous. Like the walls are a tourist attraction, but in the 19th century, I think I think the function overtook the overtook the form of wanting to keep the walls around. That's my sense, but I don't I, I actually don't know the answer to that question in any real detail. I've been to Istanbul twice. The first time was with one of Mike Duncan, like he, when he did tours, I went on the first tour and we got to climb up the walls. Our tour guide acted like we were crazy that we even wanted to see them, let alone that we wanted to go up there. When we got to the top, it was like very clear that like homeless people had been living up there and there were like lots of like animal bones and stuff in there. It was not a place that people like, that like American tourists were like, going all the time, which I always thought was weird because it was one of the coolest things I've ever done was getting to see, I mean, first of all, it's a great view. And, and then also you're just walking up on these ancient walls. So what's your experience has been with them in real life? So I, I have not been there. I would very much like to go, but I have not been there. I have not seen the, 
That's that's very that's absolutely on my list. Um, it's a thing that I really want to see. It doesn't surprise me that much that that the tour guides do not see them as an attraction because there's so much else in that city that draws the that draws the eye. Like you know, fifth century military architecture when you're standing next to the Topkapi Palace or the uh, or the Hagia Sophia or like any one of any number of other potential tourist sites there it doesn't surprise me that much where people that people were not that into the walls uh, or that they didn't think people would be the turkish tour guides really aren't into any of the roman stuff they don't really understand why you would care except maybe the hagia sophia i think they get that like they need to show it to people but there are many churches there that are really beautiful that they don't really point out well yeah and i mean even even things like the cisterns are incredible like the, these incredible feats of engineering that, that, yeah, but like, I mean, I get it, but I also don't get it. I don't get it. I'm, I'm hoping that like one of the things that I do as a travel blogger is I seek out UNESCO World Heritage Sites, even if they seem kind of like strange, like why would you go to that instead of going to this? Other, like it might be like a normal, like for example, Paris, the Eiffel Tower in Paris is like, it's cool. It's one of the most visited sites in the world. It's not a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Whereas, like, a UNESCO World Heritage Site might be this tiny town's church. And it it has a lot to do with, like, the politics of a country and what's been really preserved and, and what it can tell a story. But it also has to do with, like, the universal value of something to mankind. And so the UNESCO site that is Istanbul... I hope that like this is something that I think the UNESCO World Heritage List is becoming more popular as a thing that people specifically travel. And so I hope that it like helps Turkish tour guides understand like what people are looking for. It's like it's not a Turkish versus Roman thing. It's just like these are universally interesting things for all people. And I can appreciate your culture and you can appreciate my culture. And they're just different. Yeah. And I mean, the city is so rich with like layers of habitation and layers of cultural meaning that's kind of embedded in the space. Like the things aren't mutually exclusive at all by any stretch of the imagination. Like you can appreciate, I think one of the things that you have to appreciate about that city is the fact that it's so layered, that it's not just a Turkish city. It's, and it's not a Roman city. It's a city that's been on this spot in one form or another for going on 3000 years. And the fact that it's been there for so long, that there's so much to it, that people have found value and meaning and have built and accreted layers on top of each other for so long. I mean, I think that's pretty dang cool. I think that that is one of the attractions of the city, not just the monuments per se. It's the way in which they all form part of this incredible landscape. So I'm a travel blogger, which means I have like a million travel blogger friends. And one of them was interviewing me about like history travel. And he asked me like, if you could only go to one city, like what's the most historic city in the world? And if you could only go to one and it's like, I want to say Rome, but I think it's Istanbul. Because like, even though it's not the oldest, like Damascus, I mean, Damascus, Beijing, there's a lot of cities that are older, but like, it's been at the crossroads of so much. And it's so strategically important. And it's, you know, it's was the it was the capital of two major empires, not one. And so it's just an amazing city. Um, and I have a friend, an, another friend um, who has a who's a travel blogger, his his website is uh, traveling Mitch, if anybody wants to know a lot more about traveling to Istanbul, because he was just a teacher there for three years. So I went to visit him a few months ago. And he showed me this whole side of Istanbul that I didn't see the first time because it's like not the ancient history stuff. It's like the cool modern city stuff. Like it's an amazing city that I think Westerners are getting afraid to visit and they shouldn't be because there's just so much there and it's the politics are not so much that you can't go see there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is at the very top of my list of places that I want to go. And I think you raise a good point because it's a crossroads. That's the whole point of Constantinople slash Istanbul. It's that it's right at the crossroads of East and West. It's at the crossroads of every, it was at the crossroads of every major trade route in the medieval Mediterranean. It was the end point of the Silk Road, either that or Venice was the end point of the Silk Road. So it was a place where you could hear a bajillion different languages and you can see goods from a bajillion different places and where ideas about how the world was supposed to work and how you believed and how you prayed, where all of that was just in this incredible ferment all the time, like where you could you could meet somebody from England, you could meet somebody from Italy, you could meet somebody from Persia, you could meet somebody from the Eurasian steppe, like that all of these people were there in this kind of heady mixture. And, the, and it's still... You know, it's still that city today in, me, in a lot of meaningful ways. Well, I'm trying to think like there are kings of England who were there in days when people didn't really travel or not necessarily maybe the king, but one of the Vikings that was trying to become one of the kings or 
was down there. They're, the Kiev and Rus are basically modern Russians were down there. I mean, so uh, Bulgarians were turned into Janissaries. Like so much of what like of other cultures still has like an imprint of Constantinople or Istanbul on it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the way that I think about history in general is is through movement and through like movement of all kinds, whether it's movement of people, movement of goods, movement of ideas. Like that's really, to me, what the most productive way of looking at the past is like, how do all of these various things come together in particular places? And of all the places out there, Constantinople is the one where they all do, you know, like it, it connects to everywhere. It's the it's it's the central node of everything. Like when uh, when I did my dissertation and I, I like mapped out letters and where they were sent from and where they were sent to. And I was looking at Latin letters. So they were mostly in the or mostly in the Western Mediterranean, kind of between 450 and 650 or so. The one destination that pretty much everybody wrote to if they could was Constantinople. If you were writing to somewhere in the east you weren't writing to you maybe you wrote a letter to antioch maybe you wrote a letter to alexandria but constantinople was the place that everybody wrote to because it was the center of everything it was the center of politics it was a it was a religious center it was a center of trade if you were writing to somebody that's where that's where you were writing it was where everybody went and that was the case not just in the not just when it was a, the capital of an eastern roman empire it was the case for the next thousand years too and but the walls are you know to bring it all the way back around like the walls are what enabled that the walls are what allowed the city to be more or less impregnable. They're what allowed it to withstand siege. They're why the only reason why there was still something that looked like the rump of a Byzantine empire in 1453 was because of those walls. So before we go, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about Tides of History? Because I really think everyone should check it out. And you're only on episode like seven or eight. So you're not so far along that people can't get caught up really quickly. It basically think of it like a TV show with two seasons that are running simultaneously. I'm still doing episodes on the fall of the Roman Empire. I did two on the Eastern Roman Empire, what was happening there in the fifth century. I'm doing two. Uh, I'm doing two more that are coming out in October on Roman cities, ironically enough, and the decline and fall of the Roman city. But that, so that's one series. I'm not going to do that many more on the fall of the Roman Empire. I've been working on this since I was like since I was like 21. I'm getting tired of it. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but the other thing that I'm doing is the rise of the modern world. I'm covering the period between 1350 and 1650. So I'm looking at things like I did the military revolution. So how uh, gunpowder cannons replaced knights on uh, knights and archers on a battlefield um, and what that was like for people who lived through that. Uh, I did the rise of the state. Um, I'm Right now I'm working on two episodes on the late medieval, early modern economic explosion and the rise of capitalism as a way of thinking about and organizing the world. I'm doing the Renaissance, the Reformation. And, and then when I get through the biggest topics, I'll do things like the like the fall of Constantinople, the the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Those are all going to be things that I cover all settling into this period. And when that's done, you know, probably 40 or some odd episodes down the line, I will uh, I'll pick a new topic. I'm not sure what I'll do. Maybe the Middle Ages, uh, maybe the rise of the Roman Republic. I don't know. I don't know. We're a long ways away from that. So the idea behind the name Tides of History is that you can pick different, like the way that Mike Duncan does revolutions, but he's very, he's like very specific that you can just pick a movement or a thing that happened and unravel it. But the two periods you're doing right now are not necessarily where it's going. After I'm done with the the fall of the Roman Empire ones, which will probably be like four or six more episodes after the ones that I've done already. Like after I'm done with that, I'm just going to stick with one topic at a time. Um, but the, but yeah, I want to focus mostly on periods of time. I think just because I like seeing how the various factors play together and how they and how they interconnect. You know, you can't d just take a person's life down to politics or or the economy or culture or religion or what have you. Like all of those things come together. Um, they come together in the figure of a person in a, in a place at a particular time. And so rather than look at just politics or just something like that, I really want to make sure that I'm grounded in a particular period. But yeah, what that period's going to be, that'll, you know, it'll be a, co uh, it'll be coherent, but, uh, it'll, but it'll be one topic at a time. And I chose it because I, I'm really interested the name because I'm really interested in big things and like in the big tides that move things along over the course of history. I stole it from uh, from Fernand Brodel, uh, a great historian of the Mediterranean, because his idea is that, you know, like little events like whether it's the death of a king or a battle here or a siege there, those are just kind of like the flotsam and jetsam that are sitting on top of the waves. Like the the big things that are happening underneath that, these big long-term processes, these huge reorganizations of the way that the world works, that's really what I'm interested in. 
Awesome. Well, uh, people should really check it out. I've gotten into so many new podcasts lately. So it's it's always fun to find out like, okay, so I just listened to two or three episodes of a show. I really like it. But like, which one do you go back to the next time it pops up on, you know, like that feeling? And um, I, I've been really excited, especially like today, I downloaded the new one where you interviewed the scholar from the University of Kansas who uh, is doing DNA understanding of history and she went to my alma mater so i think that that is oh really excellent yeah i went to ku but i i did creative oh that's writing. awesome i did creative writing in uh economics and eastern european history but then i had to drop eastern european history because i couldn't uh learn russian <laughs> like i took it for four semesters and the last semester i was like i can't get through this and i don't want to be here any longer at this school i really would like to be an adult now so i dropped it but i took all the other classes so i know like all the literature and the archaeology and like the history and and I just I but I cannot speak Russian to save my life. Oh my God, I took two weeks of Russian and dropped out, and then I just I was like, I can't do this. This is this is not working for me. I couldn't do like I tried really hard and I couldn't draw the letters in Cyrillic. I'm like, this is not <laughs> this is not working for me. Like I can read the Cyrillic alphabet. Like ironically, for another thing that I had to do, I used to like I used to and still do a little bit cover mixed martial arts. So I cover a lot of uh, Eastern European fighters, a lot of Russian fighters. So I have to do a lot of stuff where I'm like transliterating Cyrillic letters into things. <laughs> but I cannot I cannot write it. I'm just so glad that like uh, I'm so glad that I gave up on Russian because that was not happening. So now I live in Bulgaria and it's like it's actually been really helpful traveling around Eastern Europe having like a good Russian vocab. I can't say sentences, but at least like I can see like, oh, that sign means the toilet doesn't work. Or I can tell like a, a cab driver, I don't understand you. And like those words just like fly back into my head, but I, I can't speak or like pass a, a fourth semester test. So I don't have a degree in it. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else you want to tell people about where they can find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Patrick underscore Wyman or on Facebook at Patrick Wyman MMA, a relic of my last career as a journalist. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, thank you very much for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with you. I hope, uh, I hope we got some good stuff out there about the walls of Constantinople and the city itself. Yes. And if you do decide to go, share pictures. Oh my God. I like, I, I want to travel so bad, but I have a one-year-old and <laughs> so like, you're not traveling so tra for a while. <laughs> I mean, barely, barely anywhere, barely anywhere. The <laughs> thought of taking like a 12 hour plane flight with him is uh, that's oh sweet Jesus, man. That's not, <laughs> that's not good. But yeah, no, I want to. In three or four years, we'll see your pictures. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah, at that point when he's, when he's old enough to watch an iPad, that's, <laughs> that's the threshold we're looking to cross. Well, thank you so much. Hey, thank you again for having me. I want to say thank you again to Patrick Wyman for coming on to share his extensive knowledge of the cross currents of history, engineering, and geography that led to the Theodosian walls being so important to the history of the Roman and Byzantine empire. I've enjoyed his new show, The Ties of History, tremendously, and it's always fun to chat with someone who does such amazing work. For those who subscribe to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would take a moment to rate and review the show, it helps tremendously with helping others to find the podcast. The prize for this week's giveaway is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you'd like to enter, follow the link in the show notes to the blog post on this episode on historyfangirl.com. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on the post. Good luck.